script, use a guide, whatever you want. Uh, generate keys, do all the nuances with that. Very important. Import the keys, sync the blockchain. Once your validator is confirmed, ready to go, do not make the deposit unless it is. Otherwise, you're going to, so many people who made deposits and, and are just like losing PLS because one thing wasn't working, whatever. So, uh, and you can have multiple validators per server, you know, you know, all that stuff. It could be a single server, multiple validators, as long as you got 32 million PLS to deposit. Once you deposit, get on the network, uh, get accepted, takes a little bit of time there, become active and start validating. As far as the life of a validator, so the whole thing is staying in sync. Like you want to stay in sync with the latest state of the blockchain. So you're like, your validator is going to be continuously receiving, verifying, accepting new transactions into its local copy of the chain. Keeping the clients up, you need to keep the clients updated at least to the minimum to abide by the network rules. You don't have to take every single update. You can you know, choose the ones uh, that you want to, you know, read the technical details on that. I've talked about it before. But uh, unless you want to join the, the fork chain, if that's happening or something, keep them up to date with the, the current network rules. And then being a validator, I'll break it into two parts and we'll get into uh, nuances in this in just a second. But execution side, so you have execution of smart contracts. Validators execute the code. Uh, associated with the transaction on the EVM or call it PVM if you want to pulsify it, whatever. Um, and then uh, this could also mean state changes to the data on the blockchain as well. So take care of that. Processing transactions, send, receive, stuff like that. Deploying new smart contracts, maintaining the state of the ledger, balances contract storage, all that stuff. So that's the execution side. Consensus side, uh, validating incoming transactions. So correct format, signatures, uh, sufficient balances, of senders, all that stuff. Attestation is the majority of the job. Uh, me and Gamma get into that too, but attesting the correctness of blocks produced by other validators. Uh, proposing blocks can be chosen at random to do so. Uh, that's collecting and organizing pending transactions into a block, publishing it for other validators to validate. Uh, and then committee participation, we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, sometimes validators get to vote on proposed blocks um, and then they get uh, they earn fees for successfully uh, proposing and testing blocks or e-penalties for being offline, acting maliciously, failing to validate, all that other stuff. And the other thing uh, I'll cover real quick, too, is the network gossip. There's a few other uh, things that are sort of somewhat related, but also validator stuff. Uh, so network gossip, validators participate in gossiping where they propagate blocks, transactions, attestations on the network to ensure everyone has the latest information. Gas fee management, setting gas prices, choosing transactions to include into the blocks based on you know how much people pay, uh, all that stuff. And then the light client, light client support, uh, generating proofs for the light clients uh, to make them work. So let's digest that a little bit. I know I went through a lot of just the main points, but um, where, where do you want to dig into, Gamma? Um, so I think it's important to, so some key points about, say, starting your validator. Like, yes, yeah, incredibly important to sync up your full node first. Because so many people, like you said, so many people think they're good and then it come to find out their node didn't actually sync up and now they're leaking penalties for, you know, three days. And then, okay, what's the difference between being slashed and actually getting leaking penalties? If you're, if you're active, your validator is active, but you're not actually online, able to attest to uh, blocks or produce blocks, then you're going to get leaking penalties. Leaking pen penalties are slightly more than what you'd make if you were online. So say they're, you know, like 30, 40, 50% more. So the way this works is if you were offline for a day, then to get back to even, it'd take you, say, a day and a half-ish. I'm just saying broad estimate. And that's leaking, right? You're getting leaked. You're not getting slashed. You're, you're still on the network. You can leak for a really long time. But then it would take you a really long time to make that PLS back, right? Because you'd have to you'd have to come back as long as you're offline plus, say, 30 or 40% of the time, right? So it's important that you don't freak out if you're offline for a day because it's going to take a day and a half, maybe two days to get back, back into profit, right? So it's not the end of the world, but if you had like a long-term you move or whatever, right, then maybe you need to come up with a plan. I was like, how are you going to keep your validator? Like you say you're offline for like three days. Okay, no, no problem. It takes you, you know, five days to come back. Once you turn it back on, no big deal. But if you're gone on a business trip for like three months and then your validator goes offline, you know, 
Like three months, that's a long time. Maybe you want to come up with a plan where you can access your validator and keep it online with updates. Because if, like, a, like you said, updates aren't super critical to be done right away. I actually wait a couple weeks for my updates and I know what's going on with the clients and I do a lot of clients and a lot of nodes and there can what be, I there do can be bugs and updates. Is wait a couple weeks to make sure everybody's good, right? Nobody's complaining out there. There's not some weird thing happening. And then I update my stuff. So my validator is like the last thing. So I'll have testnet nodes that I update. I'll have my mainnet RPCs updated. And my validator is like the last thing that I, uh, that I update after I know that everything is working. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that because as long as the consensus rules don't change, which is a hard fork, and you're going to know about a hard fork because everyone's going to be screaming about, hey, there's a hard fork. You need to update within two weeks because at this block, new consensus rules are taking in, taking effect. And the way those work is, right, it's published. You have like usually weeks and weeks and weeks, like a month, two months out. And they say, hey, this is that this update, right? Everyone needs to be updated to this version because on this block, new consensus rules are going to be, you know, take effect on the chain and that everybody more than six or 7% of the whole validator set has got to be running this new version so that we're all in sync and we don't get forked off. Right. That's not like a thing. They just slip through and they're like, Oh, don't worry about this. And on a Tuesday and nobody talks about it. And then now the whole network is all screwed. No, no, you know, weeks in advance. And even if you didn't even know about it, they give you so much time to update to the new version that you probably don't even need to know that there was an update to, for that that is a hard fork because they give you so much time to update for the entire network to update. That's not even really a problem because most people are going to be updating within a few weeks the next day if you're really aggressive, right? So you, you have your full node online, then you deposit because you can have your keys on your node. Like you set up your node the first day, you're not synced at all. You can set up your, you can create your keys. You already have your keys ready. You can put those on your validator, on your, on your, in your beacon chain. Start up your validator client. It's not active. It's not hurting anything, but it's running. And you know that your validator client sees 10 keys. Like you loaded 10 keys in it whatever you haven't deposited yet no big deal now you're syncing right the validator machine's not online it sees that you have 10 keys it's already there one thing that people always get confused on is when they create their they import their keys they put their keys in um i know with your script oh actually this is the thing i was going to say with your script you have two different users on your server one's like the val1 and one's like node and there was a user who was like, I don't even know all mess. I was like, I wouldn't one of your chats. And I was saying, hey, there's a guy in Pulse Dev using your thing. And then I tried to yeah. help him. But he was like, he was in his node user trying to start it. But then all the keys he needs to reference were on a completely different user. And I was like, how is this working? Because I'm usually, you know, I, I run my stuff with root. And then you have a, another user that's on top of there where you do all your stuff. That's not a, that's not a root user. Yeah. Right. So the, you have like the note, two other users, and I was like, "Oh, this confused me. I don't know what's going on here." Just yeah, just on the this script, I have a node user that script creates, and then everything runs as a node user to be you know the least the least privileged user possible. And then sure. literally, I don't know how anyone gets confused. I mean, I know how they get confused because they don't know Linux very well, and they can't yeah. they don't get confused with commands or whatever. But literally, if you go by these instructions completely. There's no way to to mess it up. It's it's just software. At the end of the day, they've been battle tested. So, anyways, yeah. people who set up validators they don't know Linux very well, and they get confused. Yeah, they no, the key, miss one or whatever. But yeah, the node user is the priv unprivileged user that everything runs as for security purposes. Yeah. And so what it looked like for this to you guy was he put stuff in the val user, and then he was running under node, and then he was trying to reference stuff that was in an, under a completely different user. I was like, I think you messed up there, buddy. Maybe mm -hmm. you want to ask <laughs> RH Mask. You know, it's like, I think you should be under this user because that's where all your stuff is. But then why are you trying to reference keys around under a different user? That doesn't make any sense to me. I do not compute what's going on here because it yeah. seems like not the way, right? Because there's so many people who've used your stuff. No problem. I know your stuff's not broken. 
And I'm like, I think you messed up here, buddy. A little this bit. Is, to, to be fair, this is the hardest part. This is taking your, if you generate your keys somewhere else and you put them on your validator, the hardest part is, oh gosh, okay, the, the, I need to get these commands correct. So like, to be fair, is is the part most people have trouble with, but I, I don't know how to write it out any, any more clear other than <laughs> commands and explanation. But uh, no, yes. I would like to okay. read your instructions, right? I was like, hey, you're used. I mean, I have my own instructions, like, but we're not using my instructions. My instructions aren't helping you. You used his instructions, and I'm sure it's very clear, right? Because many people have done it. We've talked about it a lot. Like your instructions are awesome. And there's a bunch of other people who have great instructions too, but my instructions don't help you. If you're using David Feeder's instructions, there's slight yeah. differences that confuse people, especially if they don't know you Linux, different path structures. You have you, your users are set up differently than the way I, I set mine up. And it, you know, I mean, there's just changes, but yeah, it was a thing, but mm -hmm. yeah. So going back to, yeah, you were syncing your validator. You have your keys loaded. You already know, right? This is what we we're the tie-in was. You are you imported your keys onto your node in the correct method. You restarted your validator. You have like your validator can see your keys because what you do, right, is you'd put in the data directory. You're gonna use either the default with the under the same user, <laughs> which the default is the client already knows what the default uh, path is. Or you're going to give it a data directory and then tell it, which is what I do, is I put my validator keys under the consensus client folder right next to the beacon chain data. It's like right there. But I had to tell the, the validator client that data directory is blockchain consensus, right? And then actually that's it. And then you're good. Yeah. But if you don't do that, then it's all confused. It's like, I don't see any keys. I was like, yeah, because you didn't tell it where to look for the keys. It is not going to yeah. magically know where the keys are, right? No big deal. So you have your deposit, right, file sitting in your back pocket, just ready. Well, maybe not literally in your back pocket, but in a safe or something. But it's sitting there and you're syncing and it takes you a day to sync up like a Geth node, right? I just did it on mainnet in like, I don't know, less than 20 hours just to like prove a point that I was like a guy was like, hey, I don't think you can do it in 24 hours. I was like, oh, I've been kind of doing it in like 10 and 12 hours. I think it can be done in less than 24. Let me see if something drastically changed in the last year. I don't really run get that much. I run more Aragon. So I was like, oh, let me test it. No problem. I don't have a problem being wrong, but let me just gather the data and see. No big deal. Less than 20 hours. Yeah, I'm right. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't really matter. I was just Mr. Good yeah. Internet. Yeah. I think it's yeah, no, 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 it, was a thing. it was a thing. You know, I mean, I talk to smart people and they're like, I mean, when they say something, they'll be like, you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Let me see if I'm wrong because I I'm wrong all the time. No problem. I have no problem being wrong. Challenge me, please. If I say something that's not correct, I will fix myself. Um, you know, or I will prove you wrong, which is kind of actually more likely. <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know what i mean it's funny um yeah yeah so you're synced up you deposit as soon as you're synced like and your logs will tell you you're synced you can put a curl command into geth into aragon f syncing that actually tells you that you're synced so you can look at the logs and see that you're you're up right with your block height but then you can actually give a curl command that calls the f syncing uh, method and then it tells you if you're if you're synced so it's either syncing or it's synced really only two states right pretty easy to tell now that's not really in any instructions i'm just kind of like a note you know that there are multiple ways to know whether or not you're syncing or not you probably have them in your instructions i haven't looked but you know and then you deposit and then you go to the launch pad right the official launch pad that's ran on pulsechain.com launch pad period pulsechain.com it's now, it should be a server that you run. I have to look. I have all the servers on my computer, right? It's IPFS now, right? So you run it on IPFS. You run your own local server. Then you run through the instructions, right? And then it, it has all the instructions there, but they're not really as clear as, say, it, an actual step-by-step -step instruction that, that, that you have or, like, my instructions that are actually much shorter. Um, so 
you deposit your, your keys. Once you deposited your 32 million PLS into, well, it really gets burned technically. So it gets deposited into a contract from which it never comes back. And, and then this is like a side note, but it's like, you know, people are interested in these things. So, so what happens when you stake in the ETH uh, staking contract for, to become a validator, you're actually transferring your PLS into a contract that into an address that it never comes back out of. So it's effectively burned. And then all of your, your principal, when you unstake and all of your um, inflation, the rewards you get all um, is reminted supply. So, you know, fun fact for, for anyone who cares about that, you know, it's a subtle difference. It's important. So, because some people think that there's like some honeypot of a contract that you can attack and you could like steal trillions and trillions of PLS. I'm like, well, no, not really. Because this means it's burned. So like that PLS isn't mm. coming back. You know, you, you exit, you set your withdrawal address, your, your reward for being a validator, which is inflation. And then also the tips, right? You, come back to your address, the one that you chose. And then when you exit, you actually get back your principal too. Minus any penalties you may have incurred, of course. Right. And the contract takes care of all that math. So, and that's like the most important part of like syncing up is like just waiting to sync and then depositing. You wait your, you deposit, you could wait up to say 18 hours, almost a day for the deposit to be recognized could be shorter, could be longer. So around 18 hours or so, and people will ask after like three hours, hey, I haven't seen my deposit. I was like, well, you might see your deposit a few hours in, but you know, you might be waiting 12 or 15 hours for the, for the deposit to be recognized. And then once your deposit is recognized, then you're in the queue. So depending on how many people are, are in the queue ahead of you, uh, which I believe it's 16 now um, in and out because it used to be four, but I think it's 16 now with the upgrades. So there's, there's not that many um, like, you know, you, you can go through the queue pretty fast to get in and get out of the network, but it takes a while. So once you deposit, you're not going to be active, maybe less than a day, but I think the expectation should be a day, right? For you to be active. So your validator needs to be online when you become active. Otherwise, you're going to get leaking penalties, right? And then you can start, I mean, now you're, now you're live, right? You want to talk about some of the things you need to be aware of running a validator, like any possible like internet and, and power backups you might recommend to your people that follow you? Yeah, so I've talked about this too before in tweets. Um, I mean, if you're doing, I, I get rid of a lot of the things that go wrong just by running in the cloud. You know, I'm glad most people don't do that because you know, good for decentralization. But uh, the people who do benefit from not having to, you know, pay for utilities, worry about battery backups, stuff like that. Um, but uh, and of course, it costs more. You know, there's like a few hundred dollars per month depending on your specs and all that stuff for cloud hosting. However, um, there's advantages there. And then the, the advantage of running at home, of course, is, okay, you know, if you want that nerd feel, oh, I'm running my own server at home, you have all that stuff. However, again, battery backups, you got to have, uh, you need to isolate your network. And you know, I got the security uh, uh, diagram pulled up here too of the different stuff that I've figured out and, and tried to synthesize as far as worrying about the, the local stuff and keys and all that stuff. But network security, very important. Recommend like literally segmenting uh, the router, uh, segmenting, the, the validator on a different network, all that stuff still can talk to the internet just in case something does get happened. It's not going to affect your other computers that you do crypto on and otherwise. Um, yeah, there's advantages and disadvantages. Um, but for me, you know, being in, in, uh, in software so, for so long using cloud, like on almost on a daily basis to me, it was like, oh, I would want to spin it up in the cloud. I want to do that. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to do it at home. I want to put it in the corner and never look at it and just update it when I need to. Totally cool. A lot of, a lot of different ways to do it. So yeah, there's a few notes on security I have there. Yeah, I mean, I run a lot of servers in the cloud with uh, with automation, and I run my own validator at home. So, like, 
battery backup. Like I have a two hour battery backup that's not only connected to the computer, but also to the modem and to the router. Right. And it's hard lined in right with even that cord. Right. So it's not over Wi-Fi or anything. And it's all on the battery backup. So when the power goes out, my Internet. Well, actually, I have fiber now. I have to get a battery backup on the fiber modem. But if you have cable, then you just put it on your router, your modem, your computer. And it's the power goes out, it turns back on. Um, if the validator runs even out, as long as the validator is running with power and it loses the internet, as soon as the internet comes back on, it'll restart back up and you don't even have to touch it. Right. Get and Aragon should work that way. Now, whether or not the computer is set up to stay running, right? You have to do the power settings and, and look at some of the system settings to make sure that, right, if you if you lose um, internet or whatever, or like if you're online for a day, then it doesn't automatically shut off and all that. So that's a basic stuff, right? You want the thing to be on all the time. But I, one day I had power go off because of some maintenance or whatever, like six times. And I never once had to touch my validator and it's running fine. It, the power went off. Didn't lose the internet because I was battery backed up all my internet. And then it came back on, right? But I also have it like the same setup with my my local system here. So when the power goes out, in my area, unfortunately, it goes out quite a bit. And then I don't even get uh, any interruption because my internet is on a battery backup. And then on my system over here is under Wi-Fi, right? Other side of the house. But it's under uh, battery backup too. Um, that's one of the chief complaints about like uh, disk corruption, like, database corruption because they weren't on a battery backup their computer just shut off out of nowhere and then they try and restart it and they're like now they're now the database is corrupted and there are like all these weird errors and it doesn't want to start up i was like well you maybe geth and aragon can fix it maybe but a lot of times if you have like a really bad like your internet your whole house internet just shuts off and then now you're you you weren't able to do the shut off correctly, which is literally takes a couple seconds. Like you, when you tell the client to turn off, if you're using like a system process or if you're telling Docker to turn it off, then it gives it right some time. Time to cleanly shut down. Set, yeah, cl do a clean shut off, and then it saves the database. And then you you might lose, you know, a few hours. I mean, I've seen it even doing a clean shutdown. I've seen it lose like three days worth of blocks then you just turn it back on it resyncs up those three days of block which takes like you know 20 minutes or something and now you're back in action the database didn't co get corrupted it just saved at a state that was prior than what you kind of expected but there's nothing wrong with the client there's nothing wrong with the database so having a battery backup is like the number one thing if you're doing like a home setup right it's that's even more important than saying like oh i need to have double internet or whatever like yeah, the internet doesn't matter that much. Like, it's good to have like an alternative internet if your whole uh, fiber or your cable just completely goes out for like a whole day. Like, yeah, connect it to like a wife, uh, like a cell, right? Cell Wi-Fi temporarily. You can, but you can I don't know whose wifi. internet goes out for a week though. I would just be yeah. like, eh, I'm just gonna lose fees for a week. I think. Yeah. That's, I mean, why go online? I mean, I just moved to the cloud, but that's me. I'm just saying. Right. People overthink about things that actually don't even matter and they don't even prepare for the thing that actually does matter, which is the power. Just having a battery backup will save you so much grief. Um, and protecting your keys. That's the thing that matters more than anything. Make sure you do not well, lose yeah, your keys. Okay, well, here, let's talk about key key management. Yes, very important. So say you you start your you, you get your validator keys, right? And you you create them on a computer that's segregated right which you should you should create the keys on a dip segregated computer that isn't connected to the internet and and all that right because it's going to generate 24 words like in the terminal and you're going to have to write those in a piece of paper and then it actually makes you type them onto that computer so you need to make sure that that computer isn't isn't your daily driver windows computer that is you know you know what i mean like yeah. make sure you're not a clean os i mean i use linux and mac but 
I got four. I got four options here too. I list on the wiki. So live yeah, CD, right. bootable USB, use another machine, virtual machine, cloud, and like there's a bunch of different ways. To yeah, do. yeah, yeah. So you, so you, you. So I'm just thinking about worst. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen? Even if, so you, you, you started your validator, you made it on a, a system that was like maybe not the best system. Okay, but you made your ten keys. It gave you seeds. Okay, okay. Hopefully those seeds are not compromised ever. Okay, so but the worst thing that can happen if somebody gets those seeds is they recreate your 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 validator keys. Okay. Well, if they make more than you made ten validator, if they if you made ten validator keys, you deposited them with the withdrawal address back to an account that you had like on a treasure, right? Which I would recommend back not to a MetaMask hot wallet or anything to like a hardware wallet. So those withdrawals are those uh, PLS. Is always gonna only gonna ever go back to your hardware wallet that's in a safe place with seeds that are saved on in metal and all that stuff, right? Well, yeah, one caveat right. though. One one caveat. So make yeah. sure that um, the you set a withdrawal address because if you don't set a yes. withdrawal address and they steal your seeds, they can set a withdrawal address. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. I was just talking about the withdrawal address. Yeah, make sure you set that. Like, this, incredibly important for security. Like I didn't realize that when I when I first started learning. Wow, that is literally the the way that. I mean, of course, generating separately. Yes, all that's like you should do it regardless because you don't want them to get your keys and it, you know they could. Yeah, you know, I'm, gonna, you I'm, I'm gonna we're gonna do that. I'm gonna go with what's the very worst thing that could possibly happen. So you have your withdrawal address set, and it's safe in a treasure, right? You're good. Somebody gets a hold of your seeds for your um. For your for your keys right so they can regenerate your 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 withdrawal keys or you know your you know your keys they can they can generate more of them so they can not only deposit for you they're not going to do that right so say you have 10 keys that are on a validator so either somebody gets into your server and you you accidentally kept unencrypted copies of the keys on your server okay but most instances have a plain text password right in the folder that you can look at so it really doesn't even matter this whole encryption thing anyway so they get in there they get the keys okay so with those keys if they were to say get an unencrypted folder that says these are my keys with like 10 keys in them you'd set the withdrawal address the worst thing that can happen is they exit your well okay there's two things that can happen they could run another server with those keys and then get you slashed. Okay, that's actually the worst thing that can happen. So what happens if you get slashed? So you lose about a million PLS, right? And then you get back, you know, 32, 31.7 million PLS back to your withdrawal address. So that's like the worst thing that can happen is you lost like an over a little over a million PLS because somebody else got your keys they ran another server as a validator. They got slashed because you're running a you're running a validator. They're running a validator with the exact same keys. You're slashed. Okay, you lost a million, but you still got your 32 or 31.8 million PLS back to your withdrawal address, which hopefully they don't have access to because you did it the correct way with a treasure with protected seeds and you know like say if you're like in the cloud or something like they don't even know you, but you know they you're running a validator. And they get your keys because you left your validator keys, you know, in the home folder and you didn't delete them when you imported them, right? Or something. Yeah. All right. So that's okay. actually the worst thing that can happen. But you got to set the withdrawal address. If you didn't set the withdrawal address, then you, somebody finds your keys, then they can set the withdrawal address to their address and then they can exit and then they get all the, right? And then they get all the PLS. That's pretty yeah. much what the security diagram says. Like, yep. have you taken I can't even read it. I just know this yeah. stuff. Yeah, somehow. I think I think impersonation. <laughs> yeah, like I said impersonation or exiting. Uh, if you've set a withdrawal address, or if not, then yeah, they can set a withdrawal address and then exit and get your funds. So yeah, that's that's um, like literally the word. I mean, so so I mean, you can they could slash you, which you get back the PLS, then or they can they can run the validator keys themselves well they would be slashed because you're running them too um they could exit for you and then you're getting the you're getting the pls anyway so you know yeah. 
So it's about just ha- setting a withdrawal address to an a to a hardware wallet that you protect, like you have a billion dollars in it, right? Even if you have a hundred bucks, mm-hmm. protect it like you have a billion, right? And and you're good, and you can ho- you can host it in the cloud, no problem, right? You do the proper server uh, security, right? Um, firewalls, and you have all these other server related things, right? We have the two levels of security with a right. You have a root user, you have a, a unprivileged other user. You run everything in. You have your firewall set so that you, they're just not randomly like getting into your server. Um, oh, one thing that people usually don't talk about is like if you're in the cloud, you usually have a dashboard. You have a company that you actually go in through. So have making sure you have two FA and proper usernames and passwords on those accounts. Like if you have a AWS or you have a, a Digital Ocean or ever, you know, have proper um, like Google Authenticator, right? Not like SMS, two FA. So you too. know, you you do you know, like you're doing a super job. Your server is locked down. Like they're never getting into your server, and then they just walk in through the dashboard make their own keys get in through the console through the dashboard and you're like okay well that didn't work out very well now they're in your server anyway because it just came in through the dashboard you know just have two fa proper passwords you know uh anything else uh for us gotta wrap up here in a second but oh sure we covered we covered the key generation we covered yeah security side uh the penalties the fees Uh, different fees. I mean, I've, I've did other uh, content on the fees you can earn and stuff like that too. The different kinds I've got. Uh, uh, yeah, the effectiveness. A lot of people are complaining about that. Oh, why is my value yeah. effectiveness not 100? Well, you never have 100 effectiveness. Like 99, 98. If you're in like high 90s, like 95, 98, don't complain. You're doing great. Yeah. You know, like nine. I'm I'm at 99 effectiveness forever, and that's just how it is. You know. I'm yeah. doing great. Validators may not be as cheap as they once were. They aren't as cheap as they once were, and they may not be that cheap uh, in the future too. We do not know, but uh, success, success of this network continues. Boy, we got some good problems to have if you were here yeah. early. Really. Yeah, no problem. <laughs>